Hello and welcome to the last talk of the first day of Gulasch Programmiernacht. Um, with me on stage, as you have seen, um, is a man who makes things work or somehow work or just make them do something. Mm -hmm. um, so you're probably all here for your love of cowboys and computational sounds and artists and weird, weird stuff. I think it's okay to say. So please give a warm welcome to Dan Wilcox and his veritable one-man cyborg performance project. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so my name is Dan Wilcox. I'm an artist, musician, engineer, and performer. Uh, if it's not obvious, I'm from the United States. Currently, I work for the ZKM, uh, formerly for the Institute for Music and Acoustic, and now for the Hertz Lab. Uh, mainly working on some weird projects and also stuff for the cr crazy Klang Dome we have in the Kubus. Um, but right now I'm talking about a personal project that has been ongoing on and off for the last 10 years or so. Um, so a little background. So this talk is basically, it's sort of an artistic project, a technical project, an open source project, kind of all that stuff wrapped into one. Uh, a little bit of my background. So I'm from basically Huntsville, Alabama. My father was a rocket scientist. This is a portrait of me as a young child with rockets. Um, I kind of, in a sort of engineering approach, kind of influenced by my father and all the people that he knew and worked with, I sort of view art as a way to do research and development for uh, looking into culture and new ideas and things like that. So it's sort of like a pseudo-scientific approach, but because you're an artist and not an actual scientist, you can kind of pretend and play with being a scientist and you don't have to actually be correct most of the time which is fun. Um, so this project is called Robot Cowboy, and it comes from a long series of things. So when I was in college and not really that serious, not that I'm that much more serious now, this is kind of all the stuff that I wanted to do, for, but it's hard to do that as a living. Playing in bands, sort of more punk rock, uh, surf style. This is an old project called Seven Inch Wave. Um, and we also had this idea of, you know, of course you all want to do the iconic computer head style thing. So you go to the thrift store, the second hand store, you buy a bunch of old TV, uh, old monitors, uh, skin them and then turn them into helmets. Um, and later on, and we used this as a whole motif for the band, it was very sort of uh, electro drums, uh, 80s surf guitar, sort of like a mix again of like surf rock, punk, uh, 80s style. Sort of like Devo surf punk is what we called it. Um, and so we all had our monikers. So I was Danomatica, Grand Botnik was on bass, <laughs> and Caltron 2000 was on drums. And we were all engineers. Uh, let's see, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and double major computer and electrical engineer. So this was the band of engineering. Uh, and then I basically ran away from the US and I went to school in Sweden for uh, art and technology because I didn't want to work for Google or whatever. Not that my grades were good enough at the time. Whatever, you know, your decisions change stuff. So I decided I want to kind of do the same thing, but now I'm in a new place and it's going to take a while to meet people, but I want to keep making stuff. So I need to figure out a way to do it myself. So I made a sort of a demo idea, which was a me, a band of just me, right? Let's just clone myself four times and make a band out of it. Maybe that works. Maybe it's a little egotistical, but it's kind of a start. Um, and so I, I made some experiments, and you come into this problem where, of where you're like, in a situation like this, it's like, do I play a laptop performance behind here? For me, it doesn't work. I think now, we as an audience are totally used to that, right? You know, lap, laptop DJs and all that stuff rocking away. If you, this is around 2005, 2006, when I was starting this project, and that was just at the point where that was sort of becoming, people were getting used to that, and before that, people were like, didn't, they didn't, connect someone with a laptop on stage was actually doing something. Let's say like late 90s, if you were working with a laptop on stage and music was coming out, like people were kind of like, what's he doing checking his email? Not, not now, that, as if that's not the case now. But anyway, I didn't want to play behind a thing. I didn't want to uh, sort of, it, I didn't want it to be me and the computer. I didn't want it sort of like a literal wall to be uh, between sort of y'all and me. I wanted us to have more of a shared experience and I also didn't want to be stuck on a stage, right? Because if you see a lot of electroacoustic uh, computer-based performance, you're sort of all sitting on a table, right? And you're kind of anchored to the table and you can't go beyond that. So I wanted to find ways to get around it. And again, I'm influenced by Devo, so we've got to have a little bit of anti-traditionalism there, a little new traditionalism. I'm also influenced by uh, sort of jazz uh, experimentalist and uh, philosopher Sun Ra. If you've not checked him out, you should definitely check him out. 
Uh, Laurie Anderson is also a big influence, sort of like the use of technology, uh, narrative, that kind of stuff. If you've not heard of her before, but this looks cool, check her out. <laughs> also, this is Maiwa Denki. They are a Japanese device art band. And basically, Maiwa Denki is a corporation. And all of their musical instruments are products that they, that they do in giant shows, which are called demonstrations. And so everybody wears the corporate, uh, the corporate outfit, and they all play the, these songs with these giant sort of electromechanical weird instruments. And yeah, these are, it's very classic Japanese, like really well done. Like these, all these things are actually like things you can buy. Um, okay, so combining those influences as a young impressionable student, I was also looking into things of like, all right, how did, if I'm thinking about trying to do everything myself, how the hell do I do it? Well, maybe we look at how people used to do it. Right, so you have an you have an Elizabethan uh, one man band. You have Joe Barrick, who is a basically a, a Native American uh, who built a sort of his own rock band that he has like a, a drum set and he has like a little organ he can play with his keys, etc. You have Roland Rashan Kirk, or sorry, Rashan Roland Kirk, who could play three clarinet sort of wind instruments at the same time. So like three embouchures on his mouth. But if if you've ever played anything like like that with your mouth, it's hard enough with one. You should watch him, try, find some videos of him on YouTube, or, or hear some of his stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing. And then, of course, you have the classic, you know, when you walk, it goes like, dong, ch, dong, ch, that kind of thing. So, okay, so I'm thinking about, like, why don't we do a version of that? How do I approach doing that um, with sort of like maybe, you know, with software, electronics, sort of like new techniques for an old problem? Um, so basically, it's just coming up with, you know, I have some sort of control, like how am I gonna like build the systems? Basically this is the system engineering design more or less. I have audio coming in and out, I have some processing of the audio, I have some sort of control, I have some mappings, and then I have some visual output. Because for me it was important that I could have the option of having a visual because you know, like you always have DJ on the stage and then you have some uh, bullshit uh, algorithmic thing flashing around behind him, right? So I need to have something like that, otherwise no one's gonna bother with me. <laughs> At least that was the idea. And I had ideas for a manifesto, and more or less the manifesto was just sort of like, okay, I need to, I need to make stuff that is uh, embodying, that is bringing sort of the computation to the body. So I basically, one of the main ideas was that I need to wear all of the stuff. So instead of like me playing like this, and let's say if I play with a guitar, I have a guitar plugged in the computer, and I'm like this, you know, and I got a tail. And it's like, you know, it's almost like the computer is standing there on stage with you as like a separate thing to me, conceptually, right? It's like you and the computer, which is fine, but I don't want it essentially to be that way, at least how the experience is. I want it to be me and the computer. I want to be the cyborg, right? Sort of like not me and the glasses. I want the glasses to fix my sight. I want the glasses to give me sort of a new... Uh, enhancement. So I want the computer to be an enhancing to me, but I also, an also important part of this is that I want myself to be the imperfection in the system. So I don't want it to be like, uh, I don't want to basically press a button and then just dance around because the computer makes everything perfect. I want the, want the computer and the system to take input from me to make it a little bit imperfect because sort of like live music and from my background of coming with playing from more of a rock band kind of perspective, I wanted it to be that you, haven't, you still have that edge of danger, right? When you go out to play, you can always screw up at any moment and I think that's important. Even when you're playing with systems that can be more or less perfect and perfect in time and all of that. So there are tricks to do that. There are ways to build systems in this way. So I wanted it to be perfect and I wanted it to fail. So things like this happen and that actually is part of the, the show in a way. So the original design was essentially this, that Again, this is 2005, so this is before like something like a Raspberry Pi. There were a, there were some single board computers, but they were really too slow to, I mean, to be useful for things like that. Um, laptops were still too big and too heavy. I didn't want to carry a black laptop and around in a backpack. Um, so basically, what I found is that around this time, late 90s, early 2000s, wearable computing was the thing that everyone was going to walk around like a like an iBorg with a webcam on one eye, and they were going to have the output here. So think of Google Glass, but with a whole bunch of old gear that you have to plug in to run it. And a lot of places bought in on this. And so in the early 2000s, a lot of companies made these wearable computers. And by the mid 2000s, when I was doing this project, everyone had moved to these sort of uh, more like dumb tablets where you, you, you do work through Wi-Fi and then you talk to a central server. So nobody wanted these heavy, bulky things around anymore. So for 200 bucks, I got what, what used to be a $10,000 computer at the time. Now, this is not super fast. It was a it's a Zybernaut MA5. It's a 500 megahertz Pentium 3 with 256 mega RAM, and I think I had 16 megs of video memory, which I didn't really use. 
Um, but essentially, this was your package. It's basically like a toaster. Uh, it doesn't have a fan. It has a, just an exposed heat sink, so it could get pretty hot since I'm running real-time audio. Uh, <laughs> which is one of, the in, one of the fun things, is if I let it run too long, it would heat up and get unstable, and then I would have to reboot it and let it cool down. That's, those are other long stories. Um, so essentially, I have the computer that's, that actually has a VGA port out going on it. Uh, I can connect to FireWire devices, which I never actually ended up needing. Uh, USB devices, so like inputs, uh, mainly game pads like PlayStation 2. Actually, a lot of, I use a lot of PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 controllers through adapters because you could buy them super cheap, like people were throwing them away when they upgrade their PlayStations. Um, so, and then mainly, my main interface is I have a sound card, so I have a, it's an old Roland, it's just a USB 1 compliant, so it works with anything, no driver. So I have two channel audio in and out. I also have, can do MIDI in and out. And with all, that, with all that setup, I also needed some way to control it. This is sort of the second version of this. So basically, you have a box. This is your transport. And in musical terms, it just means my start, my stop, my go to the next song, go back, go to the next song. <coughs> and I have one other button, which is my uh, uh, communicator. So it basically gives me a NASA Quindar tone, like uh, in the uh, Apollo 11 Apollo recording. So beep, beep, beep. So I can always buzz in when I need to. That's my astronaut stick. <coughs> and of course, the whole thing needs to be portable. So this was, this was actually a thesis project for my Master of Science uh, in Sweden. So this was my uh, presentation, because the idea was you can kind of play. This is it. Like Everything is embodied. Everything is ready to go. I plug into speakers. I plug into power. I have my controller. Uh, maybe I can plug in a guitar or whatever. But that's it. That's all I need to play, because I'm wearing the computer. All right. So that visually became this. Uh, a phase that I call cabled madness. So this is influenced by a couple other artists uh, who you may or may not know. So there's Mikael Weisfitz, who's famous for basically building the first real-time gestural uh, controllers called the Hands. This is like early, no, this is mid-80s or so when MIDI was first being standardized. You should check him out if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, this is the Aphasia project, which is basically like... <laughs> a cyborg controlling video clips and multimedia and he has a tongue controller and yeah it's very weird but it's it's very cool but basically seeing something like that told me like okay we can we can hook all these computer systems together and we can make something interesting and multimedia and artistic um this is a tao tanaka he works with the the biosense controller which is basically working from uh muscular controls muscular sensors <coughs> they also did the sensor web this is called Sensor Band. This is a Tao Tanaka and uh, two others from uh, Stein in Amsterdam. This is a mid-90s or so. So basically, this is a giant construction with ropes. And when you pull on the rope, there is a potentiometer inside so that you can use it as like a slider. All right, so I can, as I climb to the next thing, it goes like So as they're playing, basically they're playing it by climbing up and down it. Yeah, I don't know why nobody does this now, right? It's like, that's pretty cool. Why do we, why do we keep doing that? We should, have a, we should have like people climbing up and down outside up there, right? Maybe next year. Let me know. I'd love to do it. I can get my bosses to let me work on it. Um, there's Stellark too, which I could talk about Stellark forever. He is the original crazy cyborg man. If you don't know about him, just check him out. S-T-E-L-A-R-C. He even sent, he, when he laughs, he sounds like a mad scientist. <laughs> you should check him out. All right, anyway, all of that, all that input and sort of artistic input and sort of tinkering around with a lot of uh, Linux, building my own Linux kernels and trying to run them on these really old wearable computers. I ended up with this basic running system here and this character. So this is essentially the original Robot Cowboy. So it was, uh, this is sort of a Robot Cowboy's first uh, time about town. This is actually an earlier version. This is the Cybernaut uh, MA4, which is actually a Pentium 1, so it was like 100, 166 megahertz it was too slow to really do much other than I had some fun uh, camera going to console frame buffer ASCII art kind of thing. But <coughs> So that was the original idea. So that was the working system. And then it's like, all right, now with this idea, I will actually build all the stuff into it. So again, we have all the inputs. We have the power cord. It's very important to me that I have this power tail because it anchors me to electricity, to power, to be, you know, being part of the cyborg MIDI guitar other different ideas going together. 
All right, here's, here's, here's sort of the original uh, assemblage of things, right? Gum drum pads, webcam glove, blah, blah, blah. Basically all sorts of stuff. And anything that was standing around, you could, you could connect serial devices to it or MIDI devices or dance mats. And how many of y'all recognize what this is? Uh, a couple of y'all? All right, this is pure data. If, if it looks ugly to you, then you're probably using Macs. That's fine, whatever, same idea. So this is essentially a, uh, an object-oriented graphical programming environment for audio, also now for multimedia. So these are basically all like little DSP or control objects. So if I like, I can't zoom on on here, but for instance, this is a sequence player. It holds like uh, six notes, and then when the note comes out, it triggers this thing, which triggers, goes through your filter, and then makes all of this and blah, blah, blah. So all of my songs are written in this environment. It's open source. <coughs> I contribute to it online, and it's very fast and slim and runs all, on all sorts of things, on old computers, on, I'll talk about it later, on phones. So it's sort of a lingua franca of running sort of like DSP, so basically like songs, like generation of tunes, processing of inputs, generating outputs, etc. Um, and that's what all of my songs are written in. So I'm essentially composing by programming, but through in my mind, it's sort of like, oh, sorry. It's sort of like uh, you have guitar pedals and then you're hooking inputs and outputs, or like modular synths, but this is all digital. So it's a lot uh, cheaper and easier to carry. All right, so sort of, sort of like a general stage layout, so I can have a projection, I have a wireless router, I call it a stage router, so that I can actually communicate between maybe multiple computers that are running the visuals, and then myself. And then I'll really only need uh, stereo out and power. All right, and so this is, oh yeah. The helmet actually became a actual visual element. So it wasn't just a thing that I walked around with. I actually had a visual programming running on it. This was, again, on the Pentium 3, 500 megahertz. So this was actually running very early. Uh, it was basically running SDL to the console frame buffer. So I could really only do blocks, 8-bit eight, eight, eight color, no alpha blending. If I did alpha blending, it would kill it. <coughs> but if I did solid colors, that was actually pretty fast. So the idea with the helmet is that I would have live output of my control of what's going on connected with the, uh, the generation of the sound. I also had a uh, welder's mask that had a whole, about 160 LED panel all the way around that was custom made. Um, that was controlled over a serial port using a, uh, like the original uh, Arduino Mini or whatever. Uh, they didn't do too much with that, but it was pretty cool because they were high brightness LEDs so I could really get a good pattern going. Uh, yeah, there it is in test mode. And so when I, all this was together, and in 2006, no, 2008, sorry, I moved back to the U.S. and I did a tour with a friend. It was two months, about 48 dates around, the, no, 40 dates around the U.S. Did almost a big circuit, except for we got sick here, so we missed the South Dakota stuff. But uh, that was very important for me, because I didn't want to do this whole thing of, like, I go to school, graduate school, and I make a cool project, and then I write a paper, and then... Nothing happens, right? I wanted to make a project that it was like, all right, now I'm going to take it into the real world. I'm going to beat the shit out of it and see if it actually works. Because part of the idea is I wanted to build a system that could actually take road punishment. So I brought a soldering iron with me, and I had to do some hot gluing and soldering, mainly because the USB ports would kind of get pulled a little bit, and I had to, you know, the pads would lift off, and I'd have to re resolder them and re-glue them. It's fun to do that on stage an hour before you're playing, but, you know, experience, right? Uh, okay, so you're probably like... Stop talking and show me something. Right. So, since I can't do the other demo. So here's an early, here's some early stuff. From, this is from 2006 in Montreal. So there's the mini guitar. This is the test. So there, this was sort of a long-running incarnation. There's a couple of music videos. 
Let's see. Uh, where was I? I have to go back here. All right. <coughs> and as compared to my earlier patch, this was maybe a four years later. This is how my uh, pure, pure data patches started to look, become a lot easier. So internally, I basically have my own mixer. I have this whole sort of like general control program that runs a playlist. So each song is its own patch, more or less, that just gets inputs and outputs. The inputs are basically like, hey, start the song. And the song is running this fast, and the song is here. And here's audio in, and here's audio out. And through routing from that, I can then sort of have like a pretty good mix and send the stereo out. And if you've ever done any sound sound work and someone is like, I've got 10 channels and we need to pre-mix them before the show, you're like, ah, I hate you. And then I can always just say, all right, here's my stu t two stereo channels and it sounds good, just turn it up. So that's one of the useful things. So Robot Cowboy could be a, road, a rogue character going out and about. Um, later on, I started to add, so what you saw earlier was um, more of the sort of the uh, experimental stuff. So that was controlled with a lot of basically just game, hacked game controllers. And I started to add more of the rock and roll aspect. So I was sort of trying to find ways to bring the guitar back in. But still, this is actually I have a MIDI guitar uh, uh, a converter here so that I can actually grab the, the note data and send it in digitally. Um, and this is me performing at the Robot Film Fest, the second annual Robot Film Festival in New York. Um, and I also performed on a building in Linz. This is the Ars Electronica Center. This, it was about six months old at the time. And let's go here. Da, 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 da. If I can find that video. No, let's find it here. Let's go here. Nope, it's the wrong keyboard. It's worth it. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, ah, here. No, no, that's not it. That's a different project. Here it is. So this is the, yeah, 2009. So this was essentially, I took the system, and again, uh, it's modular, so actually, uh, that's a later slide, but essentially you have the main audio program, which is also running most of the mapping and the logic, and then you have input an input program that's feeding all of the the uh, game controllers coming in, and then I have a video I have a sort of video program, but all of it is connected through OSC, uh, Open Sound Control. It's essentially a protocol on top of networking, sort of raw networking sockets. Uh, a lot of music and uh, sort of creative coding environments use it, so it makes it pretty easy to communicate back and forth. So all I had to do was build a, uh, an interface to the facade that could just basically take my control data and then draw on top of it. So I was able to run essentially the same visuals, but on the side of a building, on four sides. The block-based visuals work really well on essentially what is only blocks. <laughs> and I, I grew up on the Atari 2600, so I really like the format of the pixels on this one. Uh, 
Next time I get video from across the river so you could see the whole thing, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. I was glad I was able to do that. Okay, so sort of a lot of different work in that area, but in some ways, uh, musically you kind of get, or at least artistically, you kind of get stuck into a hole, so I was playing some, no, don't do automatic. You start to play some, a uh, few music festivals with this setup, uh, and a lot of people want the helmet and only the helmet because, I mean, yeah, of course, it is a an interesting visual element and it's cool, but it's a, it was always four kilos on my head, <laughs> at least. And I had to, essentially, I had, I could see I had a small mono camera, a little video camera, and I had uh, video goggles, basically this video, inside. But it, it's mono, so I have no depth perception, and it was essentially like you're, you're seeing the world through like a 13-inch TV about half a meter in front of your face, right? So, like, to walk around, to see the table, it was very fun because I would see, I would see the table and then I would have to remember where it was because I couldn't see it anymore. Okay, there it is. Good. You learn to be good to move around without anything, to feel where things are. Like, if I would be on a stage, I have to remember where that is before I... If I would fall on my ass or something. I did run into, run into some troubles. Uh, with that, like accidentally pushing girl, drunk girls whose drunk boyfriends were around because I couldn't see and they didn't quite understand that, but whatever, that's that's in Texas in the U.S., so who knows what happens. Um, so a lot of interesting things happen for that, and uh, another aspect of it is, again, like I'm running this computer that was never designed, and I was running a custom Linux kernel on it, and I was running this real-time audio process, and I was running a lot of very, uh, I was using Nice a lot so that a lot of the stuff was not Nice, and uh, it was running very hot. Um, so, I mean, after about three or four years of that, the computer was essentially saying, all right, I'm, I'm kind of done with this. So, all right, decided to switch gears, decided to re return to my interest in space, because I was also wanting to look into maybe a new kind of theme, but keep working with this project. The idea of this project, again, is that, okay, if I have a system that I wear, I can explore kind of anything with it, like different ideas, different whatever. It doesn't always have to be the thing with the head. So this was an exploration into going to Mars. Um, and really, it's sort of built on this idea that, like, you know, we could have been on Mars, like, 20, 30 years ago, or even 30 years ago, if we really wanted, but we kind of maybe got sidetracked <coughs> with stuff that was probably easier and did help the world, but kind of doesn't make us go to cool places on the other, other side, of, you know, off the Earth. So, and also this, it was fun to think about this idea of like, where will we be? Like, you know, what is the next stage of evolution? I, I suppose one thing is the singularity. I kind of feel like maybe the other thing is that if we go to other planets, then we'll start to become different humans, different species as we grow up on other planets. And like, what does that mean, right? That's kind of interesting. <coughs> so, part of this was also, hey, we should, uh, I wanted to get some experience out of this. I wanted to like, feel what it was like. So I found this place. It's run by the Mars Society. It's a, uh, it's based in the U.S., but it's an international organization. It's basically a nonprofit that pushes the space agencies to, hey, why don't we go to Mars? Hey, why don't we go to Mars? Hey, why don't we go to Mars? So it runs all these different things, these outreach programs, sends people to Washington every year in January to poke our, our crappy government to maybe spend more money on NASA instead of blowing other parts of the world up. And... Uh, yeah, that's a whole, a whole story there. <coughs> so I basically decided to go to this uh, environment they have in the Utah High Desert called the Mars Desert Research Station, the MDRS. They run several several of these. They also run uh, one in Canada called, uh, I forget what it's called, FMARS, I think. And there's, there's one that they ran also in uh, uh, Hawaii in the volcanic area. So you're basically out in the desert in a very, like, uh, uh, Mars, Mars-like environment, and you're living there. You're running in crew rotations of every two weeks, and you're basically running the, running with uh, engineers and uh, uh, scientists and people working in aerospace. <coughs> Everyone has a role. You have a crew commander. You have a crew engineer. You have uh, yeah. I mean, they hate it if you call it space camp, but it is basically like really cool, like like adult space camp. Like we have a green hab. We have to count our water. We have to like conserve energy. Uh, we have to wear spacesuits. Uh, we work. We live all together in the habitat. Uh, we cooked everything without water. 
well, with water, but everything was dehydrated, and we had to sort of come up with different ways to make interesting things with 10 ingredients, you know. And then we had to explore. So we basically, we spent our two weeks as a crew that was exploring Mars for the first time, sort of like mapping this, this feeling of like you go over a hill, and then you're like, oh, I'm the first person that's ever looked there ever for the first time. That's pretty amazing, this feeling, actually. And it was very easy because we were the first ones in that season, so it had, it had taken about, it was about six months after the last crew rotation, so there was plenty of time for the wind to smooth all the foot tracks down and for the rover tracks to go away, so it kind of felt like you were really the only people there. And when you look out that window, except for the clouds and the, the, the sky color, right, it could, it could be Mars. So I did... Uh, number of projects in this sort of research area for, for my robot cowboy project. So this was essentially I collected different soil, colored soil samples to create a color palette for Mars and uh, with GPS coordinates. I mean, we were also tracking roads. We were tracking our paths. We were sort of designing a road network as well. Um, that's the road network from the mapping that I did. Um, yeah, here you can see where the, the habitat landed. And yeah, it's very beautiful. It was very a surreal two, uh, two weeks and felt very disappointing to return to civilization, actually. <laughs> because it's very much this ideal. If any of you all have read Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, it's, it very much felt like the beginning of that book. It's like, hey, we're all smart people and we're the only ones here and this is our playground and we can do like really fun stuff and nobody else is here to, to, to muck it up with stupidity and, and, and money and all of that, so. That part was great. So from that experience, I made an artist book. This was basically, part of my role was that it was a journalist, so I was basically writing a report as if we were on Mars, uh, make, taking pictures and all of that, as well as the other duties. <coughs> and I took notes, and I basically built, put that into an artist book. And this project has actually been picked up by other places. So some, a lot of my pictures, I put them on Flickr, and they're being used in, uh, so this is an architecture magazine, and this is a, a sort of an art magazine from in Brooklyn sort of picked it up, that's cool. <laughs> so from that aesthetic, it was like, all right, how do I translate to that to the stage, to the new project? So uh, I'm from Huntsville, Alabama, which is a NASA town. My father worked in aerospace. Uh, I knew a lot of people who worked for NASA, uh, older people. So we basically, that's where Space Camp is. I went to Space Camp in, in school. We basically saved money for a year and we all went as a class because it's in town. We didn't have to fly anywhere. So I was lucky, lucky to do that. So, a friend gave me this. This is from a thrift store. If you work at Space Camp, you have to wear that, so then you can give them back to the secondhand store, so I got lucky on that, too. So, the new project was called Robot Cowboy Onward to Mars, and it's a story about the first person going to Mars on a one-way trip. So we built this, a new suit. So basically, the wearable became a spacesuit, which is essentially its own kind of wearable. <laughs> so my so the original Apollo style portable life support system becomes the portable audio support system. The PLSS becomes the PASS. And the wearable, this is where the wearable is built in. So here you have an embedded uh, uh, an embedded Udo board. Uh, this is a four core Udo board. I think one gigahertz or so. Um, so USB hub actually had a battery. Um, again, the, the sound card, uh, a bunch of power conversion and USB in and outs. And I also, from my experience of at the MDRS, this backpack was functioning in the same way that the MDRSs were, that it has a fan, because it blows air into the helmet. That way you keep the helmet from fogging up. <laughs> it's, and, and also yourself from suffocating. <laughs> so yeah, here's a, here's a, here's a better, better picture. So yeah, Linux inside on this one. So using the same setup that I had, just running on a, on a much better computer. Um, and this was actually supported through a, a grant in a small black box theater. And I was living in Pittsburgh at the time where I was studying fine art. So this was supported with a, a grant funded show that I, I basically got some money and I got a space to work on it. So that was fortunate. This was sort of the, right, the urine collection kit. It was very important to me that some of the things that I learned, like being an astronaut, is actually kind of boring. And in many ways, you have to do a lot of checklists. Like we had to spend a lot of time communicating with mission control, saying, hey, we've, we, used, you know, we used 140 liters today. Um, this is how much energy we used today. This is the stocks. Because they, they need to, know, they need to know, know the status of how much of everything do you have and what happened. Because if something happens to you, you have like, you know, what, 8 billion people here on Earth, Earth who can potentially help you figure it out. 
And if you're on Mars with five people, it's nice to know that eight billion people can help you figure something out, but they got to know what's going on. So you got to constantly do all these checklists, and it's really boring. And you have other things like that. if you're going on a long EVA, you have to wear a urine collection kit, those kind of fun things, which we did have those, although we didn't go. We didn't really want to try them. So <laughs> they look kind of old. So this is a whole project built around that idea. Onward to Mars. So you know, actually built a whole... Uh, color scheme uh, mission patch. You have to have your own mission patch to go with the whole setup with my EVA patch as well. So that again, this element of thinking about going to another planet, maybe we become a new species. This is sort of the layout. So again, this similar layout. We have a visual program. Now you can see this is a bit more of an advanced visual program. I have more than blocks that are only 8-bit color. I can use images, that kind of stuff. Before we actually did the show, nobody was led in the theater. And we did a press conference. So I was interviewed before I went to Mars. And then when that interview was over, we could also take questions from the audience. And when the interview was over, people went in, and then I actually began my journey from the other side of the stage. <coughs> and yeah, this was a very fun experience. I basically pitched it as uh, uh, Laurie Anderson, uh, uh, Devo and Carl Sagan. No, Laurie Anderson and Carl Sagan meet Devo on the Red Planet. This was the rocket ship. This is a, a, these are mylar, sort of space age mylar inflatables uh, made by my wife, Annika Hurt. <coughs> she also helped me uh, build the uh, spacesuit. And I had, yeah, I had uh, several musical sonic instruments. So part of the, uh, the project was also that I was the first person on Mars and I had to discover the music of Mars, the, the, cyber, the frequencies of Mars to be able for humans to live there. So I had different instruments, sort of like. Right, musical instruments to figure out what's going on. This was a soil penetration tester. Um, and then of course the space guitar. And yeah. So that was some time ago and I've had to figure out things like how to make a living uh, trying to be an artist and working on software when you can, when you can't. Um, and now I have a small child. <laughs> so it's been a long project but I've not been able to do as much t time on it as I want, but now that I have this job currently at the ZKM, they uh, basically support some of the, my activities. So I have a new project, it's called Robot Cowboy Elements, and I have a new setup. So this is an overview of the setup. Um, this is sort of a long time coming. Uh, if any of y'all have like started open source software projects, they kind of take over your life and you kind of forget to do other things for a while. That's what I've been through. So this is a, basically the setup that I have now. The wearable computer is essentially an iPhone. I know, for those of you that hate Apple, I'm sorry. We can, we can argue about it later. But at the time, I chose iOS. So essentially what it is, I'm running the whole, most of the system is running in a custom-made app, which is open source and free if you want to try it, if you have iOS. <coughs> that runs pure data. For any of those, if any of y'all that use pure data and have used libpd, I'm pretty involved with that project and this is the reason why. Essentially, I wanted the option to run my system on what it was essentially a pretty ch relatively cheap and high performance mass, mass uh, easy to find uh, device. You have a touch screen, you have a lot of sensors, you have uh, core audio is very fast. I, I can get two to six millisecond latency with my system now when I never could before. So essentially everything is running on, on a phone, and we have again this core patch talking to the individual song patches, um, and then we have, this can be external, or this is also internal using, I can actually still use game controllers, I use the ones that are compatible with iOS, they just work in my system, which is nice, and then I still communicate to a laptop. This is another open source project, I contribute to open frameworks, if it's a C++ creative coding toolkit, if any of you all used it, I built an application that uses it, uh, that actually has Lua bindings for it so that I can actually create my visuals in a Lua scripting language, which is a lot faster. Instead of having to basically write a thing, recompile it or whatever, I can just write a script, reload it, whatever. So it's very fast. So patching is essentially, live patching is I create some boxes, I just connect them, I get sound. Now I can just write a script real quick, connect, connect it to my system, and then run it. And some of the elements of this are kind of getting back to my roots. So my father, again, was an aerospace engineer, and he worked on a lot of ballistic missile defense, so very large-scale stuff in the U.S., obviously, with the Cold War. So I'm looking into this kind of stuff. I missed out on this. My family, before I existed, like four years before I existed, they got to live 
in the South Seas and sees things like this. This is Kwajalein, the Kwajalein Atoll where we tested, uh, we would launch ballistic missile test targets from California down into the South Pacific. And my family was living there where my father was working. Um, and then of course, a lot of the space-based stuff. So different elements. So sort of getting get back to things. And this right now is my current new system. This is the entire thing. So essentially it's pretty similar to the old one. It's just now everything is running on an iPhone because now as of iOS 8, you could basically run uh, MIDI and core audio on the phone. And it's fast. And my phone isn't even the newest one. It's the 5S. And it runs everything really fast. Um, it's pretty amazing. I don't really have time for a demo. And so not all my stuff is working. But I, uh, I will be around. I'll be playing. If you're interested in finding out what I do, you can check me out at robotcowboy.com. And yeah. If you want to see a little of this project. No, I don't have the video there. No. No. Okay. Ah, I'll show you. Okay. Since I have some, actually I have a little bit of time. Let me show you some other dumb projects with a similar idea. <laughs> so here is. This was different exploration before I got into the the music performance. So this is explorations of what you can do with this character that has a uh, screen for a head. The year is 1995. I have just upgraded to full multimedia capacity. Does anyone know what that means? Okay, let's start up. That means we've got pity. <laughs> Can you please crack the button to the back of it? Yes. Is it easy to sing the words when all you can see are the words? <laughs> so I had the video, the video display on the inside. I couldn't see out, but I could just see the words. So with, with this particular show, this was the beginning. With this particular show, the audience would pick up the karaoke part, uh, but they had to follow me. I would basically sort of run around, and they would have to follow me to actually be able to see the words. So when I talk about different ways of exploring wearable computing, that's one part of it. Uh, and the last part is, I mentioned real quick, so again, this is a long running project. So this is the PD party. For those of you that have used Pure Data or Max before and you want to essentially run uh, your pure, pure Data patches on your mobile device, Android as well, you totally can. You're not stuck with just having a controller. You can run all the DSP on the device. So this is one option, it's called PD party. The idea is that you create patches with the little GUIs, and then it just runs them directly on the phone. Um, you can download it, try it out. I've got a lot of information on how it works. And yeah, and if you run Android, there's another one called PD Droid Party, which is essentially the same idea that my project's influenced from that. And there's another one that, were, that was also for iOS and uh, Android, which is called, uh, which is called uh, Mob Moo Plat, Mobile Music platform. It's kind of a dumb name, but whatever. Mob Moo Plat. Um, am I good on time? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, uh, any questions or... So one thing is, um, I do have a... For those of you that are like, what is this pure data thing that looks kind of weird? I would like to know more about it. Or, how do I make weird sounds on a computer? Then I'm doing a workshop tomorrow. It's at uh, 5.30, 5.30 to 8.30. <clears throat> just bring a laptop. You can run Pure Data. It's basically an intro to Pure Data. It's called Micro Orchestra. And you can run Pure Data on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So just bring a laptop, bring some weird sound sounding stuff, and uh, I'll, we'll, I'll get you making some weird noises. So, Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you.
Right. You, were, you were excellent on time. We okay. still have seven, seven to eight minutes left for questions. Ah, okay. So I have a microphone with me. So if I have a question, please raise your hand. I will bring you the microphone and you can ask Dan anything you want to know about robot cowboys and making strange sounds and stuff. So please, any questions? Come on. <laughs> it's not that late. <laughs> ah, yeah. Just a sec. Uh, do you plan another tour with your new setup? Yeah, definitely. I need to make some new... Well, I have... Uh, I actually may, it may be playing at an art space next week. And then I have a... <coughs> I'm... Uh, Performing in uh, in the U.S. in Virginia in the beginning of June at the new musical, new interfaces for musical expression conference, the NIME conference. So that's sort of like a beginning end of that. And then through the summer, I want to put some more songs out. And I've been playing around with this idea for a while, which is I want to do like a song a week. Maybe that's way too hard. Maybe a song a month would be better. But definitely, that's been on the board for too long because. For those of you that make software, it's software is never finished, right? And so it's like I, this project has been. The beginning was like, let's make a lot of cool stuff. And then it was like, all right, let's make it better. And then it was like, okay, we're making it way too too good. I'm making writing software all the time, and I'm not actually making music with it. And now I'm at the point where like, all right, fuck software. I'm done with this. My stuff works. Now I want to make a lot of stuff again. So yeah, the next six months, I think, is going to only be making music, finally. You know, there's, there's Ars Electronica in September again. Oh, yeah. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should bug them. Yeah. Uh, any further questions? The one with the tool was excellent. The two dates are probably on the robot. Yeah, Cowboy? I have a basic. Yeah. This website is kind of a mess because I'm in this transition of, of fixing it. But yeah, I have. They, a they are all are. Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> uh, bu 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 robot Cowboy. No, it's a Z. Sorry. I'm lazy. I have a the English keyboard in my office. Yeah, so I have some. Show dates there. Awesome. Yeah, just a second. Um, so with all these delicate electronics hanging around your body, um, what was the worst thing that ever happened during a performance? Oh, uh, the worst would be, uh, <laughs> again, this is a software engineering thing. So. You have a working system, but you just want to add one more thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> the night before a show, a show that you're headlining in a cool place, and uh, it runs fine, and then at the end of the first song, it crashes the computer, and then you're like, okay, that's fine. This, is, this happens before because the computer is very unstable, whatever. That's part of it, right? I deal with it. And that was always part of the show. If it would only happen once or twice, right? Because you as the audience would be like, oh, that's cool. Because basically with the head, I would fall over dead. And then I would reboot myself. And then you would see the Linux kernel booting, right? And people were like, oh, that looks nerdy and cool. Da, da, da. And Linux people were like, oh, I can see what system, you know, what is running there. You know, Debian. And, um, or Debian, I don't know how to pronounce it, whatever. And that was great. And that, that was always, again, part of this, this, the show. Um, but... There was one point where it that that particular thing happened, and I I got a bit too away from my testing practices, and I was headlining this event. So there was a lot of people were there. It was a Saturday night at this music small music festival, but a really nicely run one, and my stuff crashed. And then I go, okay, I reboot it, and it crashed again. And okay, I reboot it, and it crashed, and it crashed, and it crashed the same thing over and over again. And just everybody just left. That's the worst feeling, right? Everybody just slowly leaves, like disappointed and blah blah blah. And then you get yelled at and da 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 for being unprofessional and yeah that was the worst part a better example would be <laughs> a situation where let's say i have this laptop and a chair down in front i'm wearing the whole setup with the helmet on i can see it was actually really fun in small spaces that you could see that i could walk up and i would touch people on the nose because people didn't think that you could see and most people couldn't see the the camera was in this little black hole and you couldn't really see it easily unless you were looking for it so I would just walk up and I would touch people or I would shake their hand or whatever and I would kind of weird people out. Um, but I, So I could still do some things, but it was kind of difficult. And so what it was was the visual program crashed at the beginning of a show. And this was in, this was in Amsterdam and the Dutch are really into fun, weird stuff. So I always like to go to the, go to, go to the Netherlands. 
And uh, so they were very, they helped me out. But basically what, I, what it is, I had the helmet on and I went over to use the computer, but the resolution is very, I mean, it's like 320 at most, and I'm trying to look at a, a monitor, and I just needed to click on something. And basically what it is, at some point someone was like, up, up, right, right. And so I could see the mouse, and they were telling me where to go. And I could click, and then I would type, and then like H, you know, blah blah blah. They figured out what I was doing, and then I hit it, and then it restarted, and everyone was like, "Yay!" And then we did went the show again. And there's plenty of other times where I would pull out a thing accidentally, and someone would have come behind me and plug it in. I could kind of point where it was because I couldn't really so you have to have to feel around for it. And with the original setup, that was always a part of it, where it was it was partial. I'm wearing all the stuff, and I'm also trying to engage the audience and break what's called the fourth wall, which is literally this thing, right? So I would usually never play on a stage because I have this long cable, so I can go down into the middle of y'all, y'all can surround me or whatever, we can do this thing together, and if something breaks, then everyone, you, one of y'all can come and hook me up again, and that was always the fun part of it. Or if I would die, I would sometimes wait, maybe someone would come and like come down close to me, and then that would cause me to reboot myself. So like as a, as a theatrical element, that worked really great, but again, only if it happens once or twice. More than that, no. People are done with it. So, so you would be fine if someone comes up afterwards and take a look at your stuff. At, at, at yeah, I mean, there's not too much to see with this, but you can see the basic the basic layout. Everything is so much more compact. Um, and the, again, the old wearable is dead, and it's in my mom's basement right now, <laughs> 3,000 miles away. So, next time for that. Any further <laughs> questions? Otherwise, I would say. It Please, uh, another big round for Dan Wilcox. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming out.